In a world of fully articulating screens and in-body image stabilization, cameras these days are getting pretty stale to me. They all pretty much look the same and they all pretty much have the same features now. Except for one, the Fuji X-Pro3. Pro 3 is an APS-C rangefinder style digital camera. The build quality on the X-Pro3 is fantastic. The camera is now made with a titanium top and bottom plate, which increases the durability greatly. There are three finishes to this camera. There is the Dura Black, the Dura Silver, and then the standard black paint. The normal black version actually had a, a pretty cool look that was different than the X-Pro2. Subtly, but it was definitely different. It made it feel a lot more high quality than the X-Pro2. I think the new paint coat coatings are awesome on this camera. The Dura Black is very reminiscent of the Hasselblad X-Pan, and the Dura Silver is extremely reminiscent of the Fuji TX-1. So I think the design of the X-Pro3 is amazing, and I actually really enjoy the sub-LCD screen on the back. A lot of people say it's a gimmick, which it sort of is gimmicky, but the more I look at it and, and just play around with changing the film simulations on that camera, the more I appreciate the design of this camera and it, it brings me back to the very interesting electronic like high-end cameras from the 90s like coming out of Japan like the Contax G series and the Contax T series and the X-Pan and the TX1, the Nikon 35Ti, all of these high-end premium electronic film cameras all had this really interesting kind of this cool high-tech Japanese technology feel to them back in the 90s and I feel like this screen on the back of this camera and the overall design of the camera makes me feel like that like I have this kind of cool retro future piece of tech from the 90s in Japan, and I think that that's such a cool aesthetic. Most people would compare this camera to a Leica digital camera, since, you know, it's a rangefinder style camera, has a hidden LCD screen, but I would say this is actually more similar to the Contax G series than it is to a Leica. Leicas have a mechanical rangefinder that's coupled to the lens that moves when you focus the lens. The Contax G series, while it is technically a rangefinder, though it's an electronic rangefinder, the camera is completely autofocus. The optical viewfinder has been slightly altered to be a 0.52 magnification instead of a 0.6 magnification. Honestly, I didn't notice it. I haven't had my X-Pro2 in a while, but when I used it, it didn't seem any different to me. They got rid of the dual lens system inside of the optical viewfinder, when if you put a wider lens on the camera, it would move a diopter into place that sort of widened your field of view on the viewfinder. It doesn't do that anymore. One of my favorite lenses is the 16 mm 1.4 on the optical viewfinder on the X-Pro3 was actually outside of the boundaries of the frame lines that the optical viewfinder can display. So what it gave me in the screen was little arrows pointing to the extents of the optical viewfinder. The decrease in the magnification on the optical viewfinder does suit itself better for shooting 35 mm focal length, so that's nice. That's my favorite focal length to shoot on the X-Pro3. It's 35, 32 millimeters, so that's a good improvement as well.
The classic negative film simulation has quickly become my all-time favorite Fujifilm film simulation. Classic Negative is replicating the Fuji Superior 100 film stock. To see that emulated on the Fuji cameras is pretty awesome. I have never seen an image straight out of a camera that replicates the look of film more completely than something shot with Classic Negative on the X-Pro3. It's very interesting. It behaves more like an actual film stock than generally picture profiles on cameras do. The range of colors shift and change depending on your exposure a lot more than with typical picture profiles on cameras and behaves much more in a film-like way. If you overexpose this classic negative by maybe a stop or a half a stop, you get such a film-like image. Portraits work extremely well with classic negative if you do overexpose it a little bit. If you underexpose, people's skin starts to look a little bit too orange for my taste. But I love the way that it handles greens and blues, as well as skin tones if you overexpose a little bit. That yielded such awesome looking images just straight out of the camera that every time I would bring in the RAW into Lightroom and the embedded JPEG preview would go away and I was left with the RAW image, I would just get sad because the colors just looked a lot worse. It takes a lot of work to kind of finesse that back into the look that you're getting from the JPEG, which I ended up wanting to do 90% of the time. I might as well just use the JPEG instead of bothering with the RAW, which is something that I would never have done in the past because I would always want the RAW to be able to edit it later and, you know, craft the image that I want. But the X-Pro3 with the classic negative and the, you know, the film you know, image adjustments you can do in camera yield results that I'm happy with 90% of the time straight out of camera without doing any adjustments. You basically can shoot it as if it were a film camera and just get your JPEG images like you would have gotten sent from a lab after scanning. So it's a pretty cool experience using it. In combination with the awesome classic negative film simulation, I was using a Tiffin glimmer glass filter for pretty much most of the shots that I did with this camera while I was in China. That diffusion filter on the lens really added to the film look of these JPEG images and just made these images look so much more like they were shot on actual film just straight out of the camera. I did something pretty fun with this camera. <laughs> And I definitely recommend other people who have it try this as well. If you had a one gigabyte card, if you use the large JPEG, it works out to about 36 photos is all you can fit on that card. And basically walk around, only use the optical viewfinder and shoot it as if it were a film camera and you're using that SD card as a roll of film. It was super fun. It was a really interesting experience. I've never had that with a digital camera of only being able to take 30-ish shots, but I think it was pretty fun. I actually really wanted to get a bunch of memory cards and label them. <laughs> with different film simulations and then change the film simulation mode on the back of the camera to whichever memory card I had in the camera. I think it's awesome and you should definitely try it if you have an X-Pro3. A lot of people argued and complained about this flip down LCD because it wasn't a fully articulating LCD. It folds down so you still get the ability to shoot from the waist, which to me is the only reason to have a tilting screen in the first place. People complain that, oh, you can't shoot overhead. You can just turn the camera upside down and this, then you can see the screen. It's a pretty easy way to, to solve that issue. I used to have an Epson RD1 and there's actually a review of it on my channel. What I noticed when I was using that camera with its full articulating screen that could fold completely closed so you don't see the LCD was that I would actually end up just leaving the screen flipped 
towards me so I could see the LCD at all times just because I like really wanted to look at the images immediately because it was sort of novel that I was looking through an optical viewfinder and, and focusing with a rangefinder on a digital camera that made me more want to immediately look at the images. Basically the convenience of having that screen that could flip either closed or opened made me use the camera in a way that I don't think it was intended for which would be to keep it closed and just shoot it as if you were shooting a film camera. So what I think Fuji did here was actually a really wise decision. You're incentivized to not shoot with the screen visible, which I think yields itself more to that film shooting experience. I think this camera's inconvenient folding hidden screen actually forces you into that film experience, which is the point of the camera. I think for what it's trying to do, that type of screen was the best choice. Honestly, I was hoping that this camera would be the holy grail camera to me that I could sell my X-T3 and only use this X-Pro3 camera. But once I started hearing the pure photography aspects of it, I began to worry that it they were going to take away some features that I was hoping would just be in the camera because it all had all the same guts as the X-T3, but unfortunately that's not the case. And I guess I understand why they stripped some of the video features from the X-Pro3 just because, you know, it is supposed to be a photography only camera. It's supposed to be this pure film-like photography experience. I may be in a small minority of people who both love the methodical slow film shooting experience as well as wants to shoot professional video. So I was sort of hoping that I would be able to just jump to the X-Pro3 because I prefer the body style and I prefer that rangefinder look and I think the camera looks cooler than the X-T3. But unfortunately, since it didn't have the video capabilities of outputting over HDMI, I'm still going to need to use my X-T3 to shoot video professionally. It's an understandable choice. The X-Pro3 was supposed to be a pure photographic camera. I think it could have been a better idea if they added this sub-LCD setup to the X-100. In a world of cameras, that are all pretty much the same and everybody's basically yelling for them all to have the same features. It needs to have IBIS, needs to have 4K60, needs to have a big grip, blah, blah, blah. I think it's awesome that Fujifilm basically ignored everything and made a camera that they wanted to make that's unique and does a specific thing. I think that's such a cool idea and what photography needs to be doing to basically stay relevant. I hope that more camera companies will take risks, do unique things, have unique ideas. Pretty much for the past five years, we've reached a point where every camera is amazing. They all pretty much can do the same thing nowadays. So what I think will be the differentiating factor going on in the future will be how we interface with the camera. I think Fuji adding this hidden screen and forcing us to use the camera in a specific way is a really interesting take on photography. And I think that that's what needs to happen with the industry as a whole. We need to come up with cameras that are interesting to use. It may be a gimmick, but at least it's something different. Cameras don't need to look the way that they do now. That's sort of an arbitrary hangover from the cameras of yesteryear, but I think if we think of more unique ways to interface with the camera, then that'll change the way that we do photography and we make images. And I think that that will be really important going into the future as cell phone cameras get better and better and people are just using slabs of metal to take images. I think the shape of the camera and the way that we interface with it will become of paramount importance in the future.